and burning, everybody, especially if you're in California, in which event you have my condolences because it's very early. I was partying very late last night while Alan was working so hard preparing his answers to your very difficult, in fact, sometimes impossible questions. I want to thank you for attending this presentation. There would not be food on my table if it was not for all of the profits that roll in from these presentations. So thanks again. And Mr. Alan Gassman, a not so good presenter who doesn't really know so much, will start in one billable minute. Time to get started, Alan. Wake up. Bye. I'm Alan Gassman. I am a tax lawyer in Clearwater, Florida, with nothing better to do than to give webinars all the time. So here you are. It is Saturday, February 12, 2022, Eastern Standard Time. We try to spend 60 minutes. It will seem like a lot longer than 60 minutes. But what I want to do today for so many of you who are on here is answer a few questions and have a lot of fun. So probably more of the former than the latter. And please don't get on a ladder because if you fall off a ladder, you could hurt yourself severely. Never go up a ladder beyond your belly button from the top step. I wish my wife Marcia had known that, but that's one thing, two things my father told me a thousand times. Number one, never get on a ladder beyond your belly button because it could fall and you could die. Secondly, and this is also very important, when you're stopping in traffic and you may get rear-ended, move the right-hand part of your car pointed not to the car in front of you so that if you get rear-ended, you'll push off onto the shoulder and not have tremendous, terrible whiplash. So I hope that that's helpful and that you want to continue with this program. This program is free of charge and not even worth that amount. It does not qualify for continuing education credits. How do you ask a question? Well, just yell as loud as you can. I will be able to hear you even if you're muted. But an easier way is to click on right to the left of the word questions. That is an upside down pyramid. And then you can type in your question. If I know the answer, I'll answer it. And if I don't, I will pretend not to see it or somebody else may see it and answer it as well. Please keep in mind that if you can even stand to watch this webinar, we have other webinars that might be even better. So right now it is February 12th for those of you with dementia. This is 2022. Next Saturday, we're gonna be February 19th. And my friend, Jay Stein, isn't that Larry Stein? Larry Stein, sorry, I don't know who Jay Stein is, and I'm sorry if I've offended Jay Stein, but Larry Stein will be talking on income tax tips and strategies for the complex trust, which we're going to be talking about today. Lawrence, Lawrence Larry Stein. And then Christy Nicolo, my partner, is going to talk on Cuperts and S Corporation stock. And I am going to be in Cancun. Ooh la la. And I probably won't have internet, or at least I hope I won't. And then on the 26th, we're gonna talk about the facts of life for first year doctors, what Alan tells first year surgeons, because I do a talk every year for first year surgeons, and I thought I would just do that talk twice that day, once for all of you who could stand to watch it, and then once for the surgeons themselves later in the day. Now, if you go to our YouTube library, you can see across the first row, our estate tax work, and then our charitable work is on the second row and there's all sorts of different rows and i hope you'll enjoy it special thanks to all the people who join me uh for these webinars so anyway uh a great charitable series coming up with carl mill uh friday february 18th and the 23rd on the cpa academy which is free of charge if you're interested in how to hand, how to get on that let me know and then on Saturday, the 26th, uh, John Fixel, who's a new client a friend of, and, and friend of mine now, is going to talk on business success and customer diversity. 
John recently won an, an award from the national from the NAACP. He has a uh, diverse business in the auto dealership business, and he's done a lot for his community. So I wanted to get his ideas on how we can all succeed by doing better for everybody. And thanks to Limeberg for replaying the Spousal Limited Access Trust, going to bat with your slat, not so free, but pretty good uh, coming up next week. So anyway, let me get to the matter at hand, and that is answering questions. And the first question I was asked this week by myself was, Alan, how could I go to jail for three years? And the answer was, was uh, provided to somebody named Teresa Berenger. Now, I don't know Teresa, but what I can tell you is in my world, when people come in for creditor protection planning and say, I just did this and that, I typically think, wow, you could have gone to jail. And then people don't believe me. And I say, you know, you really should pay your taxes. If you can't pay your taxes, you shouldn't be paying other expenses because that's actually tax evasion. And you know, you shouldn't tell little white lies on applications. So what happened to Teresa Berenger? She was the, let me find where she went. Ter Teresa, Teresa, come back. Okay, Teresa was the chief financial officer of a relatively small business and they did not get their uh, 941 taxes paid. Now that's not the wage withholding, that's the 941 taxes. So she paid other taxes and she got a letter from the IRS and it scared the heck out of her. So she wanted to get these taxes paid. It wasn't, I don't think she owned this business. Maybe she had a part of it, but anyway, she was in trouble. She felt she was in trouble. So what did she do? She did, did what so many other people do. She dug a deeper hole. She decided to borrow, to get money from her 401k based on hardship. And instead of saying to the 401k vendor, hey, I may go to jail because I messed up my 941s, which may have been enough, she instead said, I'm going to get foreclosed out of my house if I don't get money from my 401k. So she got money from the 401k and she paid the tax on behalf of the company. And later on, she got a visit from the friendly FBI. Now, when the FBI comes to see you, here's what you say. Thank you very much for your service in the FBI. I'm going to get my lawyer and get right back with you as soon as I can. That's what you say when the government comes knocking. Now, I don't know what she said, but as a result of these two events, from what I can tell reading this case, she got a three-year sentence. So that is to be honest, quite sobering and not surprised. It shouldn't be surprising to a layman, but to somebody who's represented a lot of people who have done what she did and never served any time whatsoever, I find it to be a good case to show to clients as to why we should be very respectful of these tax laws, especially the evasion statute under the Internal Revenue Code, which basically says if you owe taxes and you pay something else with your money, then technically you may be involved in evasion. So get, she should have gotten advice before the 401k event, if not before the other event. Okay, so that was the first question and thank you for whoever pretended to ask it. My next question is from a new client and the new client said, what? And I explained it again and he said, what? And he said, would you please explain it better? So here I am explaining it better. And uh, this was supposed to be four slides, but it's two, so that's pretty good. So this client has a company that sells real estate successfully and company that owns real estate in a couple of different states. And I had to use states that I could spell. And uh, that's what he has. And he is interested in creditor protection because he read somewhere that if he's in a car accident or if there's hazardous waste on his property in the future, 
he might lose everything he owns and he would rather not lose everything he owns. So he asked me, what, what would I do from a creditor protection standpoint? Well, the first thing I would do is I would set up an LLC and I would call it John Smith Bank LLC or whatever he wants to call it, probably not use the word bank, but anyway, and I would set up a trust for his parents because he doesn't have children or doesn't like his children. I'm not going to disclose which of that applies. And I would have that bank LLC owned at least 2% by the trust for his parents. And the reason for that is if in Florida and many other states, you have a judgment against you and your only assets consist of part ownership of LLCs, your creditors can't reach into the LLCs or take control because of the charging order rules. So step one, I'm setting up an LLC and an irrevocable trust. Now this irrevocable trust is gonna be disregarded for income tax purposes. So it doesn't have to file any income tax returns, but it will have a bank account and it will eventually get some money and that money can be spent for the parents or charity or whatever the beneficiaries of this trust are. Now, if somebody sues the North Carolina LLC because someone trips and falls on one of the chalets that they rent, we don't want the LLC to have zero debt. We want it to have some debt. So we're gonna have the LLC owe money to the bank LLC and actually pay interest once a year. So if this owns a million dollars of real estate, this may be an $800,000 note, and it may entitle the bank LLC to place a mortgage against the North Carolina LLC assets anytime. So what have we done here? If somebody sues John, very hard to get control over anything. If somebody sues one of the LLCs, the first monies are gonna be paid to the creditor. So you say to the plaintiff lawyer, look, there's a million of assets in that LLC, but it owes 800,000 to this other LLC. If you don't settle for policy limits and you take this to trial, then all you can hope for is the net equity of about 200,000, is it worth it? And usually it's not worth it and they'll settle when they have this type of situation. Now. John's real estate, uh, active real estate company is an S corporation. And if you are owed money by your S corporation, you could trigger income tax. So instead we set up a new parent S corporation, which owns hundred percent of the existing company and the existing company can owe a note to the new parent company. And then the new parent company can be owned 2% by the parents trust, 98% by John's trust. And you'll notice that I'm making it half percent voting, 1.5% non-voting. The reason I'm doing that is because if somebody were, if the charging order rules don't apply or you're in a state like California or Colorado where you don't have charging order rules, then even if they take over 98% ownership, they don't have all the voting rights. And therefore they can't replace the manager. And by the way, the manager will be a management company out of Wyoming, because right now, if somebody goes to the Secretary of State website and searches John Smith's name, they see all these companies. There's no privacy. So by setting up a Wyoming management company to become the managers of these, these LLCs, when they search John Smith's name, nothing comes up. And when they search the company's name, they just see there's a Wyoming management company. Wyoming doesn't say anyone to anyone, anyone. It's apparently a very unfriendly state or they respect uh, confidentiality, as does Colorado, as does Delaware. Okay, then page 26, if John Smith wants more creditor protection, he could establish a Nevada or offshore creditor protection trust for the primary benefit of his family, under the law of Nevada or Isle of Man or Nevis or Cook Islands, his creditors can't reach into that trust unless they existed and were expected to be a problem at the time that he funded it. Now, I won't go into all the nuances here, but he could maybe place 90% ownership of these LLCs 
into the Nevada Trust. Now that plaintiff lawyer who has a, a shot against him personally is going to have to break through the Nevada Trust in order to get a charging order. So that is a, a higher level of protection. Now, if John Smith were married, then that Nevada trust could be a SLAT, a spousal limited access trust. It could benefit his wife, his present wife, and his future wife, and the wife after that. That would be called a floating spouse because they look good in bathing suits. And that way he could get assets out of that trust, even if it was a Florida trust, and the assets would be out of his estate for federal estate tax planning purposes. So that answers the first question from the first client, which was, what on earth were you talking about? Now, here is a second client who had the same response today or yes, uh, yeah, yesterday, yep, yeah, yesterday morning in the conference room. I explained this so eloquently. I was so proud of myself. And he said, what? And then I explained it again and realized that I'm not explaining it very well. So I'm gonna explain it not so well again, but now I have pictures. Spouse one, let's say is a neurosurgeon. Spouse two, homemaker. They have joint tenancy by the entirety's homestead worth $5 million and investment accounts worth $5 million. Under Florida law, Delaware law, Wyoming law, if spouse one is sued, the creditors cannot touch the tenancy by the entirety's assets, can't touch the homestead, so the creditors out of luck. Now, John, I mean, this spouse one also has a medical practice under Florida law that may have to be owned by him, and we can have it assignable to his revocable trust in the event of his death or incapacity to avoid probate and guardianship. He has life insurance payable to his revocable trust on death, and he has an interest in an ambulatory surgical center, which can and should be owned as tenants by the entireties, but most healthcare lawyers don't feel comfortable with that because of the different anti-referral laws. So you either have to find a healthcare lawyer to explain that it's okay to your healthcare lawyer, or you have to uh, have that ASC in the spouse's name, in the surgeon spouse's name, which to me is insanity. Anyway, in this situation, spouse two over here doesn't have much in assets. Now, on death, this revocable trust becomes a credit shelter trust, also known as a family trust, which benefits spouse number one for his for his lifetime health education, maintenance, and support. So the building that I'm sitting in, which is a pretty ugly building, belongs to an LLC, which belongs to my wife, Marsha, which she placed into a revocable trust. On Marsha's death, her revocable trust becomes a family trust, a credit shelter trust. I am co-trustee with my choice of our friend the CPA, our friend the lawyer, our friend the pharmacist, or a trust company. And it's for my health education, maintenance, and support. And I can direct how it goes when I die among our descendants. And creditors can't touch it. My next spouse can't touch it, which we've discussed, and uh, which I've discussed with Marsha, not the next spouse. And then uh, the estate tax system can't touch it. So my suggestion to this client yesterday was to consider placing the homestead under his spouse's trust, because that way, if she dies first, it's going to be protected from creditors. It's going to be protected from a state tax. It's going to be protected from a next spouse. And in addition, if she dies first and she owns that homestead under her revocable trust, it's going to get a new income tax basis. They only paid about a million and a half for this home. It's worth five million now. When they sell it, there's going to be a huge capital gain. But if one spouse owns it and that spouse dies, then you get a new step up and it's like they had paid five million dollars for the home. So that was one of my 
suggestions. The second suggestion, which I show here on page 29, is let's set up an LLC to own those investment accounts. That LLC will be owned 2% by a new irrevocable trust. And sorry, this is, this is a typo. We'll fix it next time. That's an irrevocable trust. And then it could be owned 99% or 98% TBE, or it might be owned 49% by the other spouse's revocable trust or 49% TBE. So why is that? Why is that? Well, first of all, I can get a larger fee if I can draft an LLC and a separate irrevocable trust. But secondly, if someone sues both of these spouses, they can't reach into the LLC. If spouse one dies and spouse, I'm sorry, spouse two dies and spouse one is getting sued, then you have charging order protection. And now it's easier to place some, some of the value under spouse two's revocable trust so that if spouse two dies first, it goes into the credit shelter trust. The other part of the conversation, and if you like, I can send you a copy of the sterilized letter that I'm writing to describe this, is that we have to mention that if we go back to uh, the original scenario, if spouse two dies, spouse one has nine months to decide to let half of those joint assets go into spouse two's revocable trust, and that will provide some creditor protection. It's called disclaiming joint assets. So you can Google disclaiming joint assets, and that probably comes up. So spouse two dies, spouse one has nine months to allow half of the homestead and half of the investment accounts to go into spouse two's trust, but then spouse one cannot direct where those assets go on the second death because of the power of appointment uh, rules and the retained interest rules. But a lot of people think they have their estate to, to, uh, planning done and they've got the assets, they've got the trust, but they don't really have the know-how to make these types of decisions. For example, this life insurance, should it be in an irrevocable life insurance trust? Well, at minimum, we want it payable to spouse one's trust. When he dies, we want it to be locked up in his trust, but now it's gonna be subject to federal estate tax. It'll use part of his estate tax exemption. He's not worried about estate tax because this client is well below 24 million, but I said, wouldn't you be worried if it came down to half, if it came down to 6 million each, which it may do, and he said, I'll worry about that then. So no irrevocable life insurance trust here, but at least I can um, offer it. So here are, and, and we have a lot of questions here. Most of them are saying, uh, thank you very much for going forward, even though the show is not so good yet. Okay, thank you very much. And then uh, Larry Stein said that Larry Stein will be a great presenter. Well, it's always good to have confidence in yourself. Okay, how do you include your single member, oh, I'm sorry, your multiple member LLC? So I, I learned something new. I looked at this and I said, what is an MMLLC? Is this like Greek or Latin? Or, no, it's a, how do you include your multiple member LLC filing as an S Corp with the wife as a 99% owner and husband 100%, 1% owner? and it's only employee with a solo 401k and medical benefits into your estate. Does each spouse have a living trust of some form and replace the membership ownership of the LLC? Do you really want a separate living trust for each spouse? Okay, well, that S Corp could be owned any of the ways we show here. So pretend that the AS or pretend that the LLC there is an S Corp. In my opinion, under at least in a community property state and possibly and probably in a uh, non-community property state, that LLC could be considered to be a single member LLC if it's owned jointly by the spouses and by a trust. But in any event, it can make an S election as a multiple member LLC. The irrevocable trust on the right becomes a electing small business trust and so then the next part of the question 
is do I want a separate trust for each spouse? Well, yes, the spouse who dies first, I'd like to lock up some assets for the credit shelter if I can. And then next question, does that invalidate a solo 401k? No, it doesn't. You can still do a 401k as if it was an o sole owner. Okay, and then something about misery. You need to have multiple members for state liability reasons in misery, but it applies across, oh, Missouri, I get it, Missouri. Okay, but multiple member LLC status may not help in some states like California or, or uh, Colorado, Although if the LLC is in Delaware or Florida or Wyoming, there is some support for the proposition that charging order protection may still apply. Uh, that's based on an Iowa Supreme Court case. It was a pretty corny decision, but it was in favor of the debtor from that standpoint. Okay, so I'm gonna skip a couple slides here. Here is another question. A will or revocable trust provides that the executor trustee has discretionary authority to distribute the excess over the federal exemption amount to a charity to reduce federal estate tax to zero. Does the fact that this authority is only discretionary result in voiding the charitable deduction? The answer is yes. It needs to be compulsory to charity. So I wrote an email to some clients this morning and I know they're not listening here because they never listened to me, but I did send them an email and it said, give some thought to this. Do you, you have at least $50 million worth of wealth going to your children based on what you've done in the past? You've got more wealth above that. Do you want that to go 40% to the IRS, 60% for your children? Or would you rather that go into a charitable lead annuity trust which would pay 11% of its value per year for 20 years to charities and whatever's left would go to your children. And if it's funded with discounted LLC and limited partnership interest, your children might get a lot after 20 years and they can run the charities and get trustee fees and management fees. So that is the question here. You cannot make it discretionary. You have to make it compulsory, but there is a variation of this. And the variation of that is that it can say, on my death, this goes to my son, but if my son disclaims it, then it goes to charity, to the extent my son disclaims it. Within nine months of his date of death, it goes to charity. Or this goes to a trust for my son and charity, and the trustee can disclaim it, to charity within nine months of my date of death. So that way it's not discretionary in the trustee, it's discretionary in the beneficiary. Now, one other thing I wanna mention here, cause I had, a, I had another call this week with a very, very lovely charitable client and everything's going to charity. But this client would like her nephew to be well compensated for what he does for charity more than what the IRS is going to allow under the charitable rules. So I said, instead of leaving everything to charity, let's leave the first $12,060,000 to a trust that your nephew can administer for charity and for people who have need who don't qualify as being charities. And let's provide that that trust will also give your nephew $500,000 a year as long as it lasts. So that way he can get reasonable compensation from the excess going into the charitable foundation, but that gives him $12,060,000 that he could pull 500,000 a year from pretty much income tax-free, except to the extent that the trust has income, and then he can do other good things for the community, but not limited to, to the US charitable code. She wants to help animals in Africa, which is difficult to do uh, because of the accountability rules that apply when you do foreign things. So that $12,600,000 trust could help animals in Africa and also help the nephew. So thank you very much for this question. And thank you for the questions I've had from great clients this week that I can have the opportunity to explain. Okay, here's the next question. Please 
explain the types of trusts where beneficiaries are treated as the grantor for income tax purposes. What are their requirements? How do they work in practice? Is it possible to have a trust where the grantor is treated as the grantor until death, and then the beneficiary is treated as the grantor? It seems to me that this type of grant or trust would be very useful because we want the assets to be kept in trust for the beneficiary's lifetime and protected from his creditors, yet the income tax rates on trusts are extremely high. This is a very good question. I could probably spend eight hours talking about all the issues involved here. Uh, well, I could spend two hours. Smarter people than me could spend eight hours. But the first part is, I can establish an irrevocable trust for the benefit of my spouse and descendants, which is separate and apart from me for creditor and estate and gift tax purposes, but considered to be me for income tax purposes. And that is called an intentionally defective grantor trust, also known as a grantor trust. And I can pay the income tax on the income generated by that trust to further reduce my estate for estate tax purposes. So that's really good stuff. Now, when I die, that trust is held for my spouse and descendants. And unfortunately, with a capital U, it becomes a separately taxed trust known as a complex trust. And a complex trust actually pays income tax at the highest bracket, 37%, once it has income retained of more than $13,000 a year. So if you have a complex trust, you get with your CPA carefully early in every year, look at the income and the distributions in the prior year, and you have 65 days, that's until March 15th, to make distributions this year that count for last year, for example, I die, everyone's really sad, until they realize that the trust I left for Marcia and the children generates 400,000 of income. Then they're not so sad anymore. But then they find out if they don't make any distributions, it pays tax of 37%, then they're sad again. But then they find out that the year of, that that income is earned, or the next year, they could distribute to charities as permitted under the trust, which would then absorb the income, to Marcia, who would be taxed at a lower bracket, or to a grandchild who could be taxed at a lower bracket, subject to the to the uh, kitty tax. So you you would not distribute it to any cats because of the kitty tax, or young grandchildren without cons considering the implications. But anyway, how would you flip that trust so that that trust would be considered as owned by a grandchild? Well, the only way to do that would be to give the grandchild the power to withdraw all the income from that trust. And if the grandchild has the power to withdraw the income from the trust, then it becomes what's called a Section 678 trust. And now, instead of that trust being a separate taxpayer, it's going to be taxed. All the income is going to be taxed to the grandchild. Now, that grandchild is going to be pretty upset because the grandchild can only receive the income and the taxable income may be more than the actual state law income. But in any event, that is the tip of a very interesting iceberg of what we can do in the tax world. And I thank you very much for the question. Now, a lot of people say, how did, what did you mean? What did you say? What, how did the revocable trust system work? Well, I've shown this slide many, many times. You can just refer to it. But the first spouse's trust on death becomes a family trust, which benefits the surviving spouse, but is never subject to estate tax at the surviving spouse's level or the children's level. And then the life insurance can go into a separate, irrevocable uh, life insurance trust. Okay. Clients are in their early 50s, which I used to think was old, now I think it's young, they have about $3 million in wealth. Or does that mean they have three multiple member LLCs? I think it means they have $3 million in wealth. Using Allen's growth model, they can have 15 million when they retire in 20 years. Yeah, because 3 million doubles to 6 million, 
and then doubles to 12 million plus what they save going forward. The lifetime exemption amount sunsets uh, December 31st, 2025. That's when they get the $6 million exemption. Do you feel it's critical to set up the GST trust now? Well, I don't think it's critical that they gift to the GST trust now. It seems to me that they have their amounts well under control. But I would go ahead and set up this trust system and maybe put a million five under each spouse's trust. So on the first death, you would trip, you would lock up a million five, which would never be subject to estate tax on the second death, and would also be protected for the uh, subsequent marriage. The alternative is the Jess Trust. So under the Joint Exempt Step Up Trust, which I covered last week in our exciting presentation for those of you who were both one there and two remember any part of it. In the Jess Trust, I could uh, put th their $3 million into a trust that's a joint trust, and on the first death, the whole $3 million locks up. What are the advantages? Number one, you use the full $3 million of the first spouse's exemption amount. Number two, the full $3 million is protected from divorce and estate tax later on, in our opinion. Number three, just as a practical matter, a joint trust for a $3 million couple may seem easier uh, and simpler than having two separate trusts and having to balance everything out. Okay, page 42. Wasn't that the answer to the meaning of life in the uh, book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? He, I think he went through five books and all sorts of in interesting uh, experiences to find that the answer to the meaning of life was 42. So 42 is one of my favorite numbers because The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams is one of my favorite books. Okay, the husband has two trusts, an irrevocable spousal limited access trust for his wife and a revocable trust that on his death divides into a marital trust and a family trust. Okay, what does that mean? That means on his death, if he has more than $12,060,000, that, the, then the excess goes into the marital trust. The first $12,060,000 goes in the family trust. This is someone you want to be married to. Lots of assets. Number two, the wife creates two trusts, an irrevocable uh, active grantor trust for the children. It's out of her estate for estate tax purposes, but it's considered as owned by her for income tax purposes. It's not a slat. It does not uh, benefit her husband because we don't want to run into what's called the reciprocal trust doctrine. Her trust also divides into the family trust and the marital trust on her death. So this is a wealthy couple. They're over the $24 million. Upon the death of each spouse, which trust get a step up in basis on the appreciated assets under the current law? And that's a really good question. So I'll take you back here. On the first dying spouse's death, everything in that trust gets a step up. Then that trust divides into the 12 million 60 family trust and everything above that goes to the marital deduction trust, also known as the Q-tip trust. So now on the second death, the assets in the Q-tip trust get a step up in income tax basis to fair market value, but the assets in the family trust do not get a step up. The surviving spouse's trust gets a step up when the surviving spouse dies later. Now the assets in the slat, in our opinion, get a step up when the grantor of the slat dies and the intentionally defective grantor trust, in our opinion, gets a step up when the other spouse dies. Because if if I put assets in a trust and it's disregarded for income tax purposes and I die, then why wouldn't those assets be treated the same as assets that I own? And there's a very good article by Mitchell Gans, who's a law professor, very well respected, and Jonathan Blockmacher. Those two guys together have an IQ of about 452, and they make very good analysis as to why you would get a step up. Now, there's other people, very smart, who have come to the opposite conclusion. Um, but that is, I think, as good an answer as I can give you in a couple of minutes to that excellent 
question. Okay. In my example of a 30 million nine year interest only note, where does the money come from to pay off the note after the nine years? Well, let's go through how this works. Client puts $20 million worth of assets into an LLC, takes back a 49.5% non-voting member interest in the LLC worth $7 million, puts a seed capital gift into a spousal limited access trust of $700,000. So the trust has $700,000. And then the, he sells the 49% interest for $7 million. So he owes $7 million. The money in this trust, the $700,000, is plenty to pay that note for the first 20 years or for the first six or seven years. What do you do after that? Well, you can make distributions from the LLC pro rata to ownership. So, for example, let's go to 10 years later with the time machine, everything doubled. The LLC is now worth 40 million. 49% of the LLC is 20 million. Go ahead, make a distribution of 40 million. The trust gets about 20 million. The trust pays the note off and the spousal limited access trust has $13 million. The spouse is very, very happy. The children are very, very happy the IRS slightly unhappy. So that would be one way to pay the note. The other way to pay the note after nine years would be simply to refinance it by saying, hey, I'll give you another nine years. In fact, I want you to think about your clients and friends who have these notes that are nine year, 12 year, 18 year notes at the applicable federal rate, which is presently just over 1.9%. It's coming up, that rate's coming up. So maybe it's time to go ahead and refinance that note now. So in other words, I'm 60 years old, I'm owed a 10 year note at 2.5% from a sale I did a few years ago. Why don't I go ahead and revise the note to a 20 year note at 1.96%? If I do that, is it a gift? I don't think it's a gift if there was no prepayment penalty on the note. Uh, Christopher DiNicolo, Jerry Hesh, and I wrote a, a, uh, an article years ago called Interesting Interest uh, Questions, and that we analyzed that at the time. I don't think that anyone has really added to that analysis, but that answers the question. Now, for those of you who are new, I didn't say nude, I said new. Those of you who are new, uh, we wrote an article of uh, last year called the Biden two-step and we did a webinar on it about why you would want to go ahead and put assets into one of these trusts and take back a note and then you could forgive the note before the exemption came down. So a lot of people did that and I'm glad they did because values went up and all those values are out of their estate and all they have now for the most part are these notes which are fixed at, about, at under two percent. But what do you do with the note now? if most of your assets are the note. And that's why I wrote an article called The Biden Third Step. And uh, there's reasons to keep the note in place. There's disadvantages to keeping the note in place. And there's other alternatives. So you could uh, read that article if you like, and we can go ahead and do a webinar on it um, at some other time. Okay, the next question. And we have uh, 15 minutes remaining. I'm going to, after the 15th minute, I'm going to go ahead and answer the questions that have come in today, um, except for the one that says, I am muted by the organizer. Can you help me? Um, okay, I think some, I think Kelsey helped him. Okay, facts. Community property state, probably California or Texas. All assets are community property in one revocable trust, which is normal for a community property state where the law is much different than the other states. On the death of the first to die, we wish to give a sum of money to nieces and nephews. Number one, should they be bequests or gifts made by the survivor? That's a really good question. And I thought about that a little bit. 
And I think for estate tax purposes, they should be made by the survivor. And here's the reason. If I die with a $12,060,000 exemption and I want $2 million to go to my nieces and nephews because they sent me a Hanukkah card two years in a row, then would leave only 10 million 60,000 into the family credit shelter trust. On the other hand, if I leave 12 million 60 to the credit shelter trust and Marsha gifts the 2 million after I die, then we still have that 12 million 6 in the credit shelter trust which is better protection for Marsha and that 12 million 6 is going to grow with inflation. Now, if Marsh if I leave the 12 million if Mark, if uh, if I don't do it that way, then while Marsha would get a bigger portability allowance, possibly, that doesn't rise with inflation. So I think I got mixed up there, but the answer is wait until you die, but just hope your spouse does anything remotely similar to what you expected. Number two, does a bequest require filing a 709? Well, a bequest is a gift made on death. So that would be an estate tax return if you're over the estate tax limit. Okay, the problem with a bequest in California is that anyone named in the trust has the right to a copy of the trust. We want to avoid that. Well, that is a really good idea. So you could do a separate trust for your nieces and nephews, which would say, I only hold, I put $2 million in, in a bonds in this, revocable trust. On my death, it goes to my nieces and nephews if I have received three Hanukkah cards three consecutive years in a row. Um, and then they're only going to be able to see that trust. They're not going to be able to see the revocable trust. And that's a good point. You People in most states, or at least probably all states, including the state of confusion that I'm in, if you die and your trust or will leave something to somebody, they have the right to see everything. So it's not a bad idea to have a separate dedicated trust for uh, that purpose. And by the way, we'll be updating our applicable federal rate chart. But as you can see, the applicable federal rate has been delightfully low and uh, delightfully low, depending on how you like to use your adjectives. And uh, it was only, let's see here, 1.89% December. It's a little higher now. I think right now it's about one96 but it's based pretty much on T-bill rates each month. And I think those are coming up. So it's probably time to refinance or extend your uh, note. Now, as those of you who have suffered through so many of these webinars know, there's a special kind of note called a self-canceling installment note. So instead of a 20-year note that I could have done at 1.89% last December for a 73-year-old, I could have done a 12-year note, interest only, at 6.587%. And then on the 73-year-old's death before year 12, the note goes away. Here, let me give you a sound effect. It goes away. Poof. Did you like that? Okay, so when I have a client who comes to me with a short life expectancy, I'm going to consider doing a self-canceling installment note. But keep in mind that if the client lives the 12 years, there's a lot more interest that's been received back from the trust, and it can it can backfire. So uh, a talk about skins comes up. It's always said that if one can timely time your death, the balance of the skin is forgiven. The trust doesn't need to pay it. Is that the end of the story? Well, for the note holder, yes, that's a good point. What are the tax consequences? Well, the IRS says that there's income tax based upon the uh, termination of the debt. But there's good authority in the Frane case, F-R-A-N-E, where the judge said, yeah, you do pay income tax unless the payment was contingent on living. If the note says this note vanishes on death, then yes, there's income tax when the grantor dies. But if the note says each payment on, of this note is contingent upon 
the grantor living, then there's no income tax, according to a judge. And judges can't be wrong, right? So um, 2A, does the trust owe cancellation of debt income tax? I just said the IRS thinks so, but one judge says not if you do draft it a certain way. Does the note holder's estate include the note in the estate? The answer is no, not if it's properly drafted. 2C, any other consequences? Yes, your clients will love you and thank you and maybe even pay your bill if everything works out right. So that is the self-canceling installment note. Now there's something called the SCRAT where you use a grant or retained annuity trust to alleviate or eliminate the risk of a gift tax on the establishment of a skin, which I mentioned last week. Again, for those of you who both one attended and two stayed awake. Okay, can I comment on the one year rule for private annuity trusts and then the three year non contestability rule for a client whose kids are 30? Okay. If you would prefer not to do a self canceling installment note because the IRS says that you have to be of reasonable health to do one with using the standard tables then you can enter into what's called a private annuity agreement. And with a private annuity agreement, I give $10 million to the, to the trust or to my child, and I get back the right to get paid based upon the standard life expectancy tables, and it doesn't have to be every single year. In order for me to enter into that private annuity, and I'll just show you a number here, uh, back here, if a 73 year old gives a trust a million dollars and takes back the right to receive $92,000, $692 a year for the rest of his or her life, then dies, no estate tax, no income tax after death. That's pretty clear. Treasury regulations say that I can enter into this arrangement as long as I have better than a 50% chance of living one year at the time I enter into it. So many forms of cancer and other diseases, the, the uh, length of time expected for the person to live, even with, with metastasized cancer, is a lot more than a year. So in that situation, you would be safer using a private annuity rather than a self-canceling installment note. Now, right now, Jerry Hesh and I uh, are working on an, on an article on what practitioners need to know about private annuities. So I'm learning a lot more about them. There's always more to learn. But if you have any questions on private annuities or any planning ideas that you want to share, uh, please let us know. Now, this has nothing to do with the three-year rule. The three-year rule, which is actually a two-year rule, it's not a three-year rule, it says if I buy a life insurance policy and I have an inaccuracy on the application, like I forgot I smoked cigars. I just it just completely uh, I forgot I smoked cigars, and I forgot that I had chest pain last week. But here's my application. Boom, boom, boom. And I die one year and 364 days later, and the carrier finds out I smoked cigars and had chest pain. Oops! I just get my premiums back. On the other hand, I live two years in a day. Under the state statute, the carrier has to pay my survivors. I believe even if I lied, although the carrier probably has a cause of action against my estate for fraud, which I've never seen one pursued. But don't lie on your applications, but that's what the two-year non-contestability language is. So that's why a lot of clients will buy a new life insurance policy and keep the old one in place for two years, just in case something might happened that the carrier would say, well, you should have known that you uh, had that type of disease. And then there's a three-year rule. If I give something away, but I retain the right to use it, and I have that right within three years of when I died, then it's in my estate. And then here's the sad example. I give the farm to my children, but they let me keep my cow there. And until two years and 364 days before I die, I've got my cow there. I die, the whole farm is in my estate. So my kids will have a cow. On the other hand, if I, 
if I say, I don't want my cow there, I don't have the right to keep my cow there, I agree I don't have that right, and then I live three years, 366 days, then uh, there, the, that property is out of my estate for estate tax purposes. Let me mention for lawyers and CPAs, the Moore case recently came out telling us more about that situation. Mr. Moore gave away his ranch, but kept the right to use it. And then within three years of his death, the ranch was sold. So he couldn't use it, but he still had the right to use it three years before he died. So then he died. And the trust said, if I use something in this trust and it would be in my estate when I die, give it to charity to give me the charitable deduction. So maybe he knew that this was gonna be an issue. Well, so the taxpayer said, well, the ranch is gone, but it was worth a million dollars. We'll give a million to the charity. So there's no estate tax, right? And of course the tax court and the appellate court said no, because the trust says that the asset itself would go to charity and the asset is not there. So Mr. Moore's family paid more in estate tax. And that's the moral of that uh, morass of a story. Okay, let me see what else I had here. Okay, once the grantor insured of an insurance policy dies, and that's when we say the policy matures. So when you're with somebody and they say, oh, well, when the policy matures, that's just a, a nice way of saying when you die. Okay, number one, if possible, should the beneficiary attempt to minimize withdrawals during his lifetime so that the trust assets can go to his children? Yes, if it's a generation skipping trust. Now, we see way too many life insurance trusts that say that on the death of me and my spouse, it goes outright to the children. So it may be possible to reform that, maybe not. Talk to your advisor. Number two, if the child doesn't need the assets, will the generation skipping allow for assets in the trust to pass out to the estate of the child or grandchildren estate tax free? The answer is it may be if it's properly drafted. So I, uh, I wanted to talk about complex trusts a little bit, and then we can talk about them more uh, week after next. But here's the question. With a complex trust, for example, my parents die, they leave me a trust. I'm the beneficiary. As I said, it's a separate taxable entity. If the savings bonds in that trust are cashed in, who pays the tax on those savings bonds, Tom? And the answer is, whoever receives distributions of income from that trust in the year the savings bonds are cashed in, or within 65 days of within the first 65 days of the next year if an election is made. So for example, Tom asked me, brother and sister are beneficiaries of an estate and trust. Brothers in a low tax bracket, sisters in a high tax bracket. The only income is gonna be $300,000 of bonds being cashed out. Okay, in year one, cash in the bonds and then give the brother his, his inheritance. That's going to carry out the bond income. In year two, give the sister her inheritance. That way the brother got the bond income, but the sister needs to do something nice for the brother. And it's more complicated than all that, but when people die, you do what's called post-mortem income tax planning. And it's complicated, but it's also very fun. So I did, uh, and I did include one of our old outline on complex trust advantages and disadvantages, and I'll be glad to come back and do some complex trust uh, discussion sometime in the near or uh, or far future. Okay. For those of you who are still here with us, that means uh, that you're still on the program, not that you're still alive. Let me see what other answers there were. I mean, what other questions there were. What is Alan's opinion on filing a second 706 after the surviving spouse passes when the estate is under the limit? I would not 
do that. The, the question is, if somebody dies and they have a $12 million estate, their exemption is $12 million 60, I don't even know if it's possible that you can file an estate tax return to get the statute running, as opposed to you don't file a return and you never know if the IRS may come and, and look at that estate because the exemption would never run. I personally don't like to ask the IRS to come. I like the IRS, but I don't like the IRS auditors to come see me if they don't have to. So that's the way um, I feel about that. Okay. James asks, why do I regularly suggest Wyoming LLCs versus Delaware LLCs? Wyoming is less expensive and the people who work for the Secretary of State of Wyoming are friendly and accommodating. And when you need information about your own LLC, you can get it almost instantly and inexpensively. When you need information about your Delaware LLC, you have to pay the state of Delaware. And Wyoming is a much better place to visit than Delaware, I have heard. I've been in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and the national parks, but I've never been to Delaware. They've never invited me. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of joint trusts for Florida residents. Is this single member disregarded entity, or do I end up with partnerships when the joint trust owns LLC interests? Well, Nancy, that's a good question. And the answer is no one knows for sure. I would not uh, bet on a joint trust owning an LLC being disregarded. So I would not have an LLC owned by a joint trust own an S Corp or S Corp stock. Other than that, I'm not concerned about a joint trust owning an LLC, except that if the clients want tenancy by the entirety's creditor protection, we have two recent bankruptcy court cases in Orlando where the judge, Judge Gentleman, said in her opinion, you can't have a tenancy by the entirety's joint, uh, joint trust. Now, I respectfully disagree with Judge Gentleman, and uh, I think Judge Gentleman doesn't realize how a joint trust could work, that the beneficial ownership interest in the trust could be a tenancy by the entirety's interest itself. But until then, keep the important assets outside of the joint trust and just have them pay on death into the joint trust. If you want tenancy by the entirety's protection, the ability to own S corporation stock as tenants by the entirety's um, and uh, peace, freedom, and prosperity for everybody. All right, from Stuart, who, who asks a lot of good questions. In a family trust, do you recommend giving the trust protector the authority to give the surviving spouse a general power of appointment to appoint assets to the surviving spouse's creditors to obtain a step up in basis of assets in the family trust? Yes, I do. <laughs> Absolutely. And those are in all of our documents. So, in other words, I pass away 12 million 60,000 held for Marsha, Marsha's health education and maintenance. It goes up to 30 million, and then there's no estate tax anymore. And Marsha's getting old, and the descendants go, Man, I wish Marsha had a power of appointment exercisable in favor of her creditors, because then on her death, there would be a step up in basis. Well, up comes the trust protectors, so happy and helpful, and they give Marsha that power. And then Marsha passes away and new income tax basis, fair market value. So thank you very much for that reminder, Stuart. That was an excellent. Oh, I didn't know it was Lincoln's birthday. Well, happy birthday. That was Abraham Lincoln. He invented Lincoln Logs and the Internet. OK. For a couple well under the estate tax limit. Is it correct that a good option on the first spouse's death is that half of the estate goes to a Q-tip for creditor protection while getting a step up on the second death? Yes, Eugenia, that is a good idea if there's no estate tax concern. If there is a estate tax concern, they may be better off going with a full funding of the Credit Shelter Trust. You have to run the numbers. We have an outline and a program called Portability Mistakes that, that goes over that, but you make a very good point. Uh, Karen was laughing at the cow story. Um, you know, you have my condolences on that. Okay, Robert, 
in your example of a 12 million estate, do you file the estate tax return to get the carryover estate tax exemption of the 60,000? Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot about that, you do. So that would be the reason if you had a $12 million estate to file the estate tax return, because that would get the surviving spouse a $60,000 portability allowance. But boy, if I'm at 12 million and there's valuation issues, I think bye-bye portability allowance, I'm probably not gonna file that form 706. Okay, so that concludes the answers to the questions that I have time and knowledge to, uh, to answer. Please don't forget to share the information we provide with anyone you like or anyone you dislike in about an hour, usually two billable hours, which is about an hour from now, you'll get a, a, an email and you can watch this video again, which you would be foolish to do, or you can forward it to anyone whose time you would like to waste. And then they can also, you can go to YouTube and watch it again and again and again. If you are interested in charitable giving and if you're really interested in the technical aspects get to know who carl mill is in my opinion he is the rising star in this area we're learning a lot from carl and this will be a four credit uh presentation at the cpa academy uh two part february 18 february 23rd please join me next week for the surgeon's guide to managing your finances just change the word surgeon to anyone you like and it will apply to anyone you like. You'll see how little I know in that area. And if you're in Naples on March 25th, hopefully you'll be able to join our professional acceleration workshop for Ava Maria Law students. Da, 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 da. Thank you very much for enjoying this show.